to his followers, his presence is greater now than it was before. Hundreds of thousands of Jews throughout the world look to this man as the Messiah, a modern-day Moses, the spiritual leader who would usher in an era of world peace. The presence of God was to be revealed for all to see, fulfilling the great prophecies of the Bible. Yet in June, this celebrated religious leader known as the Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem M. Schneerson, passed away. And the fervent hope that he would single-handedly lead the charge to the dawning of the messianic age in his lifetime has faded. Who was this man known as the Rebbe? Where did he come from? And why did so many believe that he would never die? special powers that are sitting there and caring about you and I as we sleep peacefully, communicating with God, trying to formulate a plan to make the world a better place. That's the Rebbe. His main thrust is bringing into the fold uh, Jews who are gradually or have already lost their Jewish identity. And he brings them back by kindling a fire of uh, Jewish solidarity and identity and love. And I think this is a, an extraordinary achievement. I honor the rabbi in the work he's done, in the example he's set, and the inspiration, therefore, that he has given to many, many people. It is due to his influence, to his presence, that Jewish awareness and Jewish education have reached unprecedented heights on almost every continent. Is there a place under the sun that Chabad emissaries have not carried his words of tolerance rooted in Ahabat Israel, in the love for Israel, which really by extension means love for humanity? He has the two unique and necessary characteristics of a truly great religious leader. Number one is a vast and truly global vision of an ideal future, of what we talk about as the messianic age. And number two, he has restless urgency and practicality in making that vision actually happen. And it's those two qualities, the prophetic and the practical, which come together so powerfully in him and the movement that he has so transformed. part uh, either in Lubavitch or in larger cities in Russia and uh, therefore though they were very influential and looked up to by Jewish people all over the world their influence was somewhat limited 
by the milieu and the topography of where they lived. Uh, the instant media did not exist in those times, and various pronouncements of the Rebbe would not circulate the world as they do today instantaneously. Uh, the Rebbe's administration has been here in this country, in New York, uh, really at the vortex of world activity, and uh, the conglomerate of institutions that he has built uh, over the years uh, are scattered around the globe, so that he is capable today of saying something, and it is heard and uh, recorded and studied instantaneously in communities all over the world. The Rebbe has a certain insight that uh, being a righteous man that both you and myself cannot comprehend. He has certain divine powers in, uh, as you can say, compared to the prophets of old. Because Rabbi Schneerson was born in a unique era in which uh, when he became Rebbe it was during the crisis of World War II and, and the Holocaust era and when so many Jews had just been destroyed. He knew that something had to be done to bring together the remnants of the Jewish people after the Holocaust. And so he knew that Jewish education was very important. And so then the media developed at the same time, the electronic media. And Jews were searching for their roots. So all these things came together at a unique moment in history so that uh, he was successful in uh, garnering support and raising interest. He's opened the doors of Jewishness to those who really want to understand what it's about. And he's changed the face of the Jewish world. He's changed it in terms of Jews accepting Jews, Jews being responsible for Jews, Jews bringing Jews back to their Jewishness, Jews responsible for the general world, Jews in terms of their consciousness, Jews in terms of their responsibility charitably, socially and so forth. He's changed the world of Jewry. They're great promoters of religion. They were the first to create the Hanukkah candle lighting ceremonies, the various shopping centers. First to have the mitzvah tanks, first to have the Purim parades. They actually created an awakening. I think he's a great leader, great delegator, and I think he has a vision, he has vision. And I can only liken him to some business people who have the vision of creating huge corporations. It's a movement with a special philosophy and with a special way of activity, of action. You can meet the Chabad Hasidim everywhere in the world, and they are doing a very important job. People are, are looking, and they need people to come out and help. And that's what we're here to do. The reaching out to others, or you might say reaching in, after a while it caught on. Other groups started doing the same thing that Lubavitch uh, implemented, and it became again fashionable. Now you have many, many uh, synagogues, organizations that are reaching out to others, bringing secular Jews back into the fold, to the heritage. It was unfashionable at one time, and it was Lubavitch that, that, that took that unpopular, unfashionable, almost unacceptable stance because of the foresight of the leaders of Lubavitch, and in our case, the Rebbe, who saw that this was the way to go. It is uh, monumental. It is extraordinary. And in a, in, if in a lifetime we come to hear or to know of one person like that in, our, in a person's life, it is extraordinary. And uh, yet, uh, he sets an example that I wonder how many people are, are aware of. Uh, he could have chosen to, to move his uh, headquarters, uh, to move his flock, uh, to much more comfortable, uh, much safer surroundings. And I think by his choice uh, of staying in, in, a, in a very difficult setting and environment, he should give hope and inspiration to people uh, that you don't abandon. You don't leave, you don't turn away from your religion or from your home uh, for expedience. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, that he sets an example, uh, not only for the, for the Jewish community, uh, but for people of goodwill. I wish to honor leadership itself in all that is good, honest, just, and in our way of saying it, of good report, and founded upon 
the great creator to whom we owe everything. The philosophy is very different. Um, most of the ultra-Orthodox and the Orthodox are very, they want to keep to themselves. They're afraid of uh, modern uh, life and the influences, drugs and, and all kind of crime and all this. They're very worried, so they try to be insular and to keep to themselves. Chabad is different from all of those and that they're not insular. They want to go out and try to influence other Jews. Um, the ultra-Orthodox want nothing to do with television, video. It's trafe, it's considered, because you shouldn't touch such things. But Chabad says that anything that can, any tool that can be used to benefit the Jewish people is kosher. So they use videos and, uh, and broadcast satellites and everything else, and they're very open. So uh, they're very different. They don't exclude people. They try to uh, uh, bring people together. That turns some people off because they say, what do they want from me? Leave me alone, you know, so why bother me? Uh, but it's a very activist approach, which the others don't do very much or don't do at all. What's difficult, but when uh, you know why you're here for, makes life easier. When you know who sent you and, and, and you, you see results of your work, you see the appreciation of the people, the appreciation of the Rebbe, the appreciation of the old people you take care of and the kids you teach. And the people of the city, this is what keeps us going. The fruits that we see. He's the first person that really took the responsibility of the Jewish people. So I'd like to say, okay, pick up uh, your sleeves and let's do something. The Jewish world is dissolving. I see here the Italian community would disappear in a few years. There is no future for it. And uh, I think that uh, if we don't come here and really give uh, a big uh, push to it, uh, there wouldn't be a future for them. We really came to a, a desert. There was nothing. We didn't need only bring in Yiddishkeit, Judaism to the people. We brought them happiness. People were not happy. And we explained the people that one of the biggest mitzvahs is to be besimcha, to be happy. And we bring them simcha and happiness. Our, we're not making everybody religious or everybody Hasidim. But each one of them should just make another mitzvah. There's action, there's not a lot of talk. They do things. Well, they have villages and centers to help people that need help. And, uh, people that are in trouble, uh, they can turn to them for help. And in New York, they have centers there too to help people. No one is an organization that helps. I've seen them active on university campuses in England, um, particularly in the remote campuses where people don't generally have much contact with Judaism as such. Um, and when they answer, deep concentration of Jews. So um, Chabad do tend to reach these outposts. Um, and that's sort of very, very impressive. There are a lot of people out there that are lost or maybe on the fence and need that little bit of reaching out just to bring them in. And I, I think it's tremendous. And they've got the right attitude. Uh, they're fantastic people, the Lubavitch. And uh, I, I think the, the way they do it is it's not too pushy and uh, they do let you be. Uh, they let you be comfortable with what you're doing and don't force anything. You're the one that takes the steps to go a little bit further all the time. The attitude is do what you can and you'll do a little bit more each time. What he's doing for Jews in all the world, he sends people, makes school like this, in Moscow, in England, and everywhere. And Jews, they're making, they're coming closer they love each other and it's great. Instead of spending uh, Passover with their families at home, they go out to army bases and run a say there for soldiers. And soldiers are impressed by this dedication. They give charity, they are selfless. His greatness is a comprehensive greatness. It covers so many fields, so many areas. He is okay. primarily a religious leader. He is a great Sadiq. People oh, believe yeah, yeah, in yeah, his yeah, personality yeah, yeah. as one that could really help Jews throughout the world. His prayers are considered prayers that have great influence with God. That's the belief of so many hundreds of thousands. You have just to be in New York on Sundays when people queue up by the thousands to look at his eyes and to get his, his blessing. He's a great religious leader. He's a great national leader, which means even non-believers, secularists, believe in his greatness, believe in his love of Israel, believe, believe in his leadership. He is a social leader which means he takes all walks of life, all Jews from all walks of life, as equal. He gives the treatment to every Jew as if he was the only Jew on earth. 
He gets interested in the smallest details of people who write to him. He gets letters by the thousands, by the tens of thousands. He reads all of them, as far as I understand, and he tries to answer everybody. You don't find any leader on the political arena, on the religious arena, on the social arena, on the arts arena, that is interested and that loves every person from all walks of life. He is a lover of Jews. He is a lover of man. He is admired by non-Jews alike. I spoke to senators. I spoke to members of Congress. I spoke in Israel to political people. I spoke to professors in universities. I spoke to mathematicians, to lawyers, to, to medical people. All of them have that kind of admiration. He's a philosopher. He knows physics. He, he, he finds himself very well in chemistry. He's, he has explored the Talmud. He knows all the Hasidic writings. He speaks, never uses any paper. When he speaks, he could speak for hours without using one single paper. He has a memory that is uncomparable. When you put all that together, you ask one question. Is there any other human being of that stature? And you close your eyes, and try to see all the leaders you know about, all the leaders you read about, and you find that he is one gigantic person that goes in the same line like Maimonides of his time, was the greatest prosaic, the greatest philosopher. And, and among the living Jews today, certainly the most interesting, the most charming, the most fascinating, the most comprehensive leader of Judaism today. The Rebbe has been an extraordinarily inspirational leader in taking the, the traditions of our people and the joys of being Jewish and, and communicating it in a very modern context throughout America, throughout the world, and doing it in a way that's fascinating because there are people who would look at uh, the Lubavitch community and say, well, you know, this, this, is, this is a group from another time. But the, the genius of the Rebbe has been to take the timeless message of Hasidism and relate it to the contemporary world and to do it in a way that is understanding and tolerant. To create this message, we're not going to criticize you, individual Jewish person, man or woman, for what you're not doing. We're going to urge you to come with us step by step to improve your life and to make uh, the community, the, the, the broader community, uh, better than it would otherwise be. And of course, the heart of that is education. You can't lead, you can't understand, you can't teach, you can't live a full uh, life without uh, understanding and without knowledge of, uh, of the law, of the Torah. And, uh, and uh, of course, that's been the great work of the Rebbe. The Rebbe managed to hide himself. Other Rebbe's managed to hide himself from from, from the world in general, but at least for Hasidim they were revealed. The Rebbe was managed to hide himself even from the closest people. There's a book which is called Hayoim Yoim. It describes the life story of each one of the Rebbe's of Lubavitch, the seven Rebbe's, very in brief. About the Rebbe, it says he was born on the 11th day of Nisan in the year 1902. Then the next thing is when his wedding was, in between, there's a few words which say everything about the Rebbe. He studies assiduously with unbelievable fervor and he succeeds. And it is known that the Rebbe in his childhood was already writing letters to the biggest scholars at that time and they always thought they're talking to a big rabbi. They didn't know this was a child. This was very well known in all of Russia. His father was a great man. They have his father. And the Friedrich Rebbe knew very well all about the Rebbe as a child and as a young boy. And I'm sure that that's what led to, to choose him for his daughter. The Rebbe being a very, very brilliant woman, I'm sure recognized the Rebbe's brilliance right away. And I'm sure that this was just the most wonderful thing to her to know that she's going to, receive, to have such a wonderful husband. She knew the greatness of the Rebbe, probably more so than any other woman in, in the past because she herself was the daughter of a Rebbe. Instead of being devoted to being a wife, to be happy for herself and having whatever she needs for herself, she never detracted from anything that the Rebbe would have to do for the Hasidim, for the rest of the world, uh, because of her own self. It's not for us to even question why God did not grant them an offspring. We don't know what God's reason for it, but we would then, nobody would ever discuss it with her, because we understand that's a God-given thing and that's not something for us to discuss.
immediately after the Rebbe got married, he would begin to study in Berlin. At the University of Berlin, um, he began uh, his program of study. Uh, his uh, major was engineering with a math minor. He continued his studies within Paris, um, attending uh, the University Polytechnique, uh, and he continued, he received his degree from there, and he continued living in Paris up until the beginning of World War II. When Paris came under um, threat of attack, the Rebbe then uh, relocated from Paris and then went to uh, Nice and then to Marseille, and from there he eventually made his way to the United States. He amassed a master's degree in engineering. He worked uh, in the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, for a period of three and a half years. Um, this was due to the fact that he was a new immigrant here in the country and we were in wartime and everyone had to do, had to contribute in some way. The Rebbe's work was considered classified. The person came over to me and they said something terrible, something bad happened. I said, tell me what? He said the Rebbe passed away. The Rebbe's demise was like the sun just unexpectedly setting not in time at all. But at the same time, everybody felt that there is a successor. And this is the Rebbe. The only one who didn't accept it, in fact, was the Rebbe. He was against it. The Rebbe started saying he has no special instruction for that. And the, the, in other words, that the previous Rebbe did not give him any instructions. Yeah, this was going on for quite a while. Certainly did not want to take it. And he, it came to a stage that he told one of the elders, Hasidim, that if they'll bother him too much, he'll, he'll, he'll run away The people will not know where he is. But what we decided is that we went on the grave of the previous rabbi. And we put a note, we read a note, that we, if he remained like sheep without a shepherd, and we all see that the proper person is the Rebbe's youngest son-in-law, and he says that he doesn't have any instructions. So if instructions is needed, he should get the instructions. After that, we never heard from the Rebbe anymore this excuse, never. He actually started immediately answering questions, giving advice and so on, and there was immediately miracles in the, answer of the, the, the answers of the Rebbe, immediately. It lasted practically close to a year. Because in the following year, the Rebbe already, the Rebbe, the Rebbe, the Rebbe Rangin, the Rebbe said already, am I Hasidis, and so on. The Rebbe and his wife told him, how can you see the 30 years of self-sacrifice of my father, my saintly father, should go in vain? She had a great role in it, that in the Rebbe's decision. By us, giving advice in material matters is much more than giving advice in spiritual matters. Because spiritual matters is a question of knowledge. Material matters is a question of prophecy. If you take in the totality, all those, and absolutely infinite number of instances when the Rebbe advised people, save their lives, save their, their, uh, their possession, uh, gave them a possibility to achieve a goal in a much faster uh, time than it would be normally achievable. Uh, that brings to a conclusion we deal here, I would say, rather not with an outstanding person, but I use a term characterizing the Rebbe that he is not only an outstanding personality, not only an absolute unique human being, not only a writer's man and, and the uh, best Torah scholar I ever could imagine exists, but he is a kind of a phenomena in this generation. You always realized that it was a person that although he was very human in his approach to others, very realistic and very practical and very loving and caring, at the same time there was a dimension which is probably indescribable, that you felt greatness. And uh, this continued to mount over the years. It was, the closer you got, the more distant you felt. The rabbis used to say about the Aron, the Ark that contained the tablets, that the Ark carried those who carried it. 
that those people who carried the burden of Torah with most sincerity felt that they were made lighter thereby and lifted by it. And the remarkable energies of the rabbi show to me not only that he sets a very tough example for all his followers to carry on and to imitate and thus lifts all of them, but that he himself is lifted in the process and given energies that someone with less faith and less spirituality couldn't possibly have. In all generations there is a Mashiach. In reality the word Messiah comes from Mashiach which is anointed. The King of Israel was the Mashiach of his time. Many students refer to their Rebbe as Mashiach because their Rebbe was perfect. We perceive the Rebbe as being the perfect person, as the person who is totally dedicated to the objective of making the world a place that was intended by God for it to be. Mashiach will come to bring us a world, as Maimonides says, where there will be no illness and no hatreds and no jealousies and no wars, and there will be goodness and kindness and compassion, as we are all looking for great leaders, great masters who have seen the Rebbe and have seen his writings have said that this is a leader that one cannot fathom could have been in this generation and we are literally fortunate that this is our leader for our generation and the one that hopefully will open the doors of exile and bring us to the messianic advent. It's clear that the Rebbe is one of the very greatest Jewish leaders of this century. It's clear also that he's reached out as few other Jewish leaders have done beyond the Jewish world, calling on people to pursue religious knowledge and religious values. And in that sense, I think he is one of the great figures of our century.